Good morning. This is Steve Stites, Chief Medical Officer here at the University of Kansas Health System. Welcome back to our program this morning as we talk about all things around COVID and coronavirus and, and different effects to our community. We're broadcasting live from the Dolph Simons Family Studio here at KU. Joined on my right is my faithful partner, Dr. Dana Hawkinson, Hawkeye, Dr. Hawk, and many other names we call him. Sometimes some are better than others. <laughs> on my left this morning is Nicole Yedlinski. I did pretty well with that, didn't I? That's perfect. Not bad. Yeah, not bad. yeah, Nicole is a family medicine physician here at KU, is a former mem uh, member of the military and works with veterans. So we want to spend a little bit of time talking about veterans. We had a little bit of that yesterday. We're going to hit on it again today. With some really important issues. Also, Brian Meyer, who's a founder and CEO of the Veterans Community Project. Uh, yesterday, we had the founder and CEO of the, of, the, uh, of the Battle Within. So it'll be great to hear this different perspective that you all bring to that. But first, we're going to visit with Doc Hawk. Yeah. How are we Hi. doing? What's, we're the, good. what's it we're like good. out there today? Yeah, the numbers um, in the hospital right now have been consistent. So I think we had 18 or 19 yesterday. We were up to 20. It's really hanging out in the same area. Today, we have 18. But unfortunately, um, of those 18, six are in the ICU, which is not surprising, but all six of those are needing ventilators right now. So, so as we get to be more and more, again, hopefully we won't, but now we have all of our people that need ICU need the ventilators. And so that also brings into a question of the drugs that we need for people on the ventilators. Right, and there's some big news yesterday with yeah. Decadron coming right. out, a study coming out of England. Yeah, absolutely. So, um, you know, initially from the original Chinese experience from what was published, it was thought that high dose steroids were um, not to be used. They were actually causing mortality. However, there was this very good study that has been published now that shows that some dose, lower dose of steroids um, can be beneficial and actually improve mortality in these critically ill patients. It dropped it by a third. I mean, yeah. that's a big number. It was good. And, and these were, again, critically ill patients. These were very sick. So it's interesting to note, too, however, that um, our therapeutics group, we've had steroids on our treatment algorithm since day one. And just even a couple weeks ago, I talked with Lewis Satterwhite, our, one of our ICU doctors, and, and Nate Barr about that. Now, we still had criteria, and we were still kind of cautious about using it because of what was published before, but we have been uh, using it in some of the populations, again, if they meet criteria, um, just to make sure that it's under a, a methodical way so that we can continue to gain knowledge, but also really try to decrease the mortality and morbidity from this disease. And it's interesting, the other two coronaviruses that have caused lung disease, um, n namely SARS and mm -hmm. MERS, n the steroids didn't do so well in either of those. Right. So this is a little different. And, yeah. and, but now just as a pulmonary critical care doc, former critical care, <laughs> now I don't do that as much anymore. But, but, the, um, but it's interesting to note that for years we knew that steroids in certain select patient populations yeah. can improve, but what you can't do is just go give it willy-nilly because you'll actually make more people sick if you do it like that. If you follow criteria, it, may, it can make a difference. Dana, why is it working in SARS-CoV-2 but not SARS-CoV-1? You know, also early on we have talked about, well, it's not just the viral infection. We think a lot of people clear the viral infection. But what happens after, and we've said this before, the cytokine storm, um, the immune dysregulation, the inflammatory process. So just as you said, we know that steroids have really uh, tampened down inflammatory process in it general. Yeah. And so I think that is continuing to be uh, part of the process here with the treatment with the steroids. But again, it's not only what drug, the steroid, or how much, but also at what time are you giving and Which patient in the population course. makes yeah. a huge difference, yeah. And so we are probably learning that with all of the drugs that we're looking at, um, convalescent serum, remdesivir, any of the other um, immune modulating drugs and including steroids. Are we doing any hydroxychloroquine now? W no, hydroxychloroquine was taken off of our treatment algorithm probably four weeks ago or so. Yeah. And so I, I think that was a, a very good thing to do. Um, there, was, there was some consternation and debate early on. Why aren't we giving it to everybody who comes into the hospital? Um, or are we just giving it certain criteria? I think we were really um, vigilant in trying to, to hold off on that and using it 
for only certain criteria and not every patient that was in the hospital, not every patient that was in the hospital and being discharged because they were doing well. Um, but however, uh, yeah, hydroxychloroquine has been off for a while and we haven't been using it. Which is you know, it, it is important because there's always this national debate about how we should or shouldn't treat disease mm -hmm. and, and, and people want to just throw, let's do it, we do it, we got to do it. Yeah. And, and you have to remember the rules of medicine. <clears throat> and one of those key tenets is do no harm. Mm -hmm. And when you have a disease you don't know much about, you don't know much about right. and you don't know if what you're going to do is going to help or not help. And, that's what I think we have to be careful with. Be, and I think because we've found a couple of major advances so far. One is the use of anticoagulation or blood thinners yeah. because of the help with those small clots. Yeah. And the second is this lower dose, because it's not a high dose. It's not a very high you know, dose. If you think about how we use steroids a lot of times, we, we give people a ton of steroids. And in yeah. this case, uh, this is not a ton at all. This is a no. relatively low dose mm -hmm. of decadron. We use a lot of prednisone in the United States. England tends to use a little more decadron, so they, that's why I think they probably use that drug. But it's really, the, the key is a low dose of a steroid mm -hmm. in, the right, in the right population. Yep, absolutely, absolutely. And just to your point, too, I think early on as well, as, as far as our experience goes in the United States, as you said, we were throwing the kitchen sink at people. Um, to try and do everything that we could to try and save their life. Well, now we've kind of really refined a lot of our treatments. There's still a, ref a lot of refining to go and a lot of uh, evolution to take place, but we are learning more and more of things not to do, things to do, and I think we are slowly getting to um, that area where we are going to be able to best treat people as much as possible without another active antiviral or a vaccine right. available. Or a combination of things yeah. like that available. So, Dr. Yudlinski, we're sitting over here. We could talk all day long about steroids and things of that nature, but we really wanted to hear from you and from Brian about your work with the military and the Veterans Community Project and some of the special challenges that are affecting our veterans here in our COVID in the COVID crisis. Yeah. So, certainly, we can't neglect the. Uh, the medical effects on our veteran population. About half of our veteran population is 65 years or older, and we know that those individuals are at increased risk for complications from coronavirus. We also look at our veterans that have been exposed to uh, chemical exposures, burn pits, uh, Agent Orange, and they have increased rates of diabetes or lung disease, and that puts them at increased risk for complications from COVID-19. Um, we also look at things like mental health, PTSD, social isolation. Mm -hmm. Those are all factors that play into our veterans' health and well-being. Um, a lot of uh, these veteran service organizations don't have access to uh, the the technology like Zoom or virtual visits, um, and so being able to reach those veterans where they are. We also have a high numbers of unhoused veterans or veterans in transitional housing, and they're not able to uh, social distance uh, themselves or really even access medical care easily. So there's a lot of barriers in place. Um, fortunately, there's a lot of great people who are working with our veteran communities to try and mitigate those, uh, those factors. So Brian, I think you classify as one of those great people. Mm -hmm. So talk to us a little bit about the um, Veterans Community Project and, and, and your history with the military. Uh, thank you. I like to think of myself as one of those great people too, so I appreciate you leading me in on that. Um, so uh, my organization, Veterans Community Project, for anybody who's not familiar, uh, we build communities of tiny houses as transitional housing for the homeless veteran population. Uh, our first community founded here in Kansas City is up at 89th and Troost. We have 49 tiny homes as well as a 5,000 square foot uh, community center on site where we offer case management, um, acute medical, dental, uh, and a number of other services through there. Uh, my, my personal background with the organization, I'm, the, I'm one of the co-founders and the current CEO. I'm actually an attorney by trade. I was uh, practicing law. I had started a nonprofit getting veterans free legal services. And through that work, uh, really started working a lot with the homeless veteran population. Uh, myself and the other co-founders decided that we wanted to try something a little bit different to treat this issue. And that was uh, how Veterans Community Project was kind of born. Veteran. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Are you yourself a veteran? Oh yeah, I'm sorry. I was uh, I was in the Marine Corps from 2001 to 2006. Uh, deployed twice to Iraq. I was a uh, crew chief on a helicopter, or I was that I was that guy hanging out the side of the helicopter on the gun. 
All right. And by the way, I do want to say thank you. I'm seeing the Clorox wipes behind you. It's always good to see pillars of infection control being displayed during our program. Thank you for doing that. And we didn't prompt that just to say that was that was spontaneous. So, Dr. Yelinsky, talk a little bit about what this means. What a what an amazing project. That uh, I'm reminded a little of Habitat for Humanity. I did some work for that a long time ago, and and I'm just impressed about that. And what does it mean for our our veterans who are homeless or things to find that as an opportunity? And then, Brian, I want to come back to you for a follow up after this. So, yeah, there are some great people doing great work in the veteran community. So I myself am an Army veteran and uh, my husband as well. He was a helicopter pilot, so he was the one actually driving the, the helicopter. But you were but, flying out uh, on the <laughs> side. You're right. Uh, he man, may have flown you around. You never know. Um, but... Uh, but yeah, there, there's some great people doing great work and it means a lot uh, to veterans to have those individuals working on their behalf because it can certainly be, once you leave active duty military service, um, many veterans find themselves lost, not sure. Uh, we have high rates of either unemployment or underemployment when you leave military service because here you are, you've served your time, you've, you've had a, a, a a prescribed path for the time that you've been in the military and then you get out and all of a sudden uh, you get to pick where you want to live you you have to find a job you have to do all of these things and sometimes it can be quite overwhelming and especially for our veteran population that that oftentimes do have struggle with PTSD or other mental health uh, disorders it can be quite challenging Brian, why, why is it, did you all both chime in here, but Brian, why, why is it that some veterans end up homeless and some end up like you two? Yeah, I, mean, I mean, if we could figure that out, I, I think that uh, we would have cracked the code there. I, I, but I, I can tell you, I think it's a, really, it's a really fine line. So even for myself, uh, when I got out of the Marine Corps, I had a great support structure in place. Uh, Good amount of friends, good amount of family, support, moved back here to Kansas City. Uh, I even had my own struggles. And, uh, you know, there, there are instances looking back now that I realize, you know, a step left or right, I would be in a very different place. Um, like, you know, yes, I, I have my law degree. I have my master's. I did all that post-military. That was all spurned from a moment where, uh, to be honest with you, I got in trouble. And a judge basically told me I had to go to college. Uh, in order to avoid a little bit more trouble. And that led me down a certain path, end up where I am now. Uh, who knows if, I, if I'd got another judge or, or taking a different route where I would be. So I think it's a very fine line for everyone. Yeah, you know, that, that is a remarkable story and yeah. reminds me maybe of some teenage years for all of us. But, it, but I think it obviously the, 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 the gravity here is so much greater. And you must yeah. have, you deal with this, I suspect, in your role as a family medicine physician. Uh, absolutely. Um, fortunately, there are, uh, at least in my own family, um, my husband and I found trail running as a coping strategy for the struggles after military service. Um, um, and there's an organization that we became involved with called Band of Runners, and it brings uh, trail running community to veterans as a way of uh, forming those connections and finding a community and also a coping strategy for how to deal with uh, the struggles. Um, and, and so there are Veterans Community Pro uh, Project, there's uh, VFW, there's lots of veteran service organizations that are out there and that certainly is one of the struggles in this time of coronavirus and in in this pandemic is those organizations that rely on these social connections and now all of a sudden we can't meet in person anymore um, like we used to you can't uh, get together and so that's been one of the ways that we've tried to use uh, Zoom or virtual meetings to try and reach out to those veterans and to reconnect. Yeah, that's that. You guys, this is special work. So, let's turn and first see if there's questions from media this morning before we go to our listening audience. Jill. All right, what do you got? I do have one from 41 Action News. They read an article about a person that was a COVID patient and ended up having a lung transplant. Can you speak to that? 
I think I probably can. On yeah, that one. you can take this a lot easier. I think that would they're, be. They're wondering if that's going to be another. No, so this is a hard one. Um, you know, we follow a lot of lung transplants, and I did that a lung transplant fellowship a number of years ago. The um, in order to have a lung transplant, you have to have end stage lung disease from really many different causes, and you have to be otherwise healthy. So what has to happen with COVID is if you have, it, it can destroy your lungs so much that you can't breathe on your own. And it may be possible then that once you've cleared the virus and the virus is gone, then, um, and your lungs are, you're not able to, to breathe on your own or you're so short of breath that your life is very limited, that you could then have a lung transplant because of it, and, and infections can do that, and that that it, you know that they can happen with influenza, that can happen with other viruses as well, but you have to ha you have to clear the virus, you have to be otherwise healthy, and you have to be able to be strong enough, and and despite this terrible problem, you have to be good enough clinically to survive the transplant itself. Yes, we we do. I mean, you think about other very bad infectious diseases. Cystic fibrosis can be one like that. We transplant people with CF, and they at the time they may have terrible infections in their lungs that have caused their lungs to deteriorate. COVID is like that. It can cause such damage from fi uh, scarring and fibrosis that you can have a lung transplant. I would not say that is a good therapy for for COVID. However, uh, it is not generalizable to a large group of people, um, and as we know, so many of patients who have COVID um, are folks who have other chronic health problems that would likely exclude them from getting a lung transplant. So that's why it's going to be very limited in scope. And I think we can make a weak analogy to the one or two patients that were cured of HIV with a bone marrow transplant. Right. That is certainly not going to become the standard of care right now because there are so many complications associated with the bone marrow transplant. Yeah. So. Yeah, th those, are, those are challenges. Okay. And another question, there are reports in Georgia of the public asking is the virus a hoax? What would you say to those people? Wow, so that, we're all going we're all four going to take on this yeah. question for just a minute. Um, I'm going to start out on a somber note. How many, how many deaths have we had, uh, Dana? I think it's like in the hospital. Yeah, from, from COVID here. 20. 22, right? I think, yeah. or 24. And I would say that those 24 patients, um, could they be alive to speak, would tell you it's absolutely not a hoax. Mm -hmm. And anyone who thinks it's a hoax is probably not listening to real news. Um, I think there is a very different presentation of how a virus affects a community depending on where you live. Absolutely. It has been much worse in New York, and we've emphasized time and again, time of it, how long you're exposed and how dense that exposure is, meaning how much virus do you get at the time of the exposure, really affects how um, the person who's being exposed is, is going to do and therefore how a broad group of people will do. So in New York, if you think about dense public transportation and you think about being inside a lot, that's different. There are other communities across the world that have equal density to New York, but don't have, it tends to be more outside than inside. And, and that those communities aren't perhaps as affected. But you can see the terrible toll that this virus has exacted in New York, in Detroit, Chicago, LA, Seattle, and other places, and so many of our nursing homes where it has been, in some places, a very, very high mortality rate. So it is most definitely not a hoax. And I would suggest to you that the people in China and Italy and Germany and Spain and France and many of the South American and, and mm -hmm. Latin American countries would also tell you it is absolutely not a hoax. So, so don't don't believe that. That 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 will only lead to your own your own challenges. Because if you think it's a hoax and you go out and act like life is normal, um, life will will humble you, and, and and that's not what you want to have happen to you right now, Dana. Yeah, yeah I would I would certainly agree. You know, we we've had uh, Damian Stevens, one of our our critical care doctors, on. He went to New York. You know, we have people who have been to these places and know about the devastation that it's caused. You know, the other thing to look at is, like, look what has happened to our economy and our world economy and our local economy. Nobody wanted that for just a hoax. That is not anything anybody would want, people not being able to work or put food on their table. So there are countless examples, and all you, you have to do is open your eyes, have good understanding of accurate news sources, and, and you will understand that it's certainly not a hoax. And I would also point to, you know, influenza normally takes about 20,000 lives yeah. a year. This last year was a bad case of influenza, mm -hmm. so it was higher than that. 
but uh, coronavirus in the United States in three months has taken over 100,000 lives, 100, so they're not comparable. Dr. Yablinski thoughts, especially with their veterans, and, and Brian, I mean, I, you guys have seen this, uh, the effects of COVID in, in the veteran community. Not a hoax there. Yeah, I agree. Uh, again, you know, you talk about populations that are at risk of contracting coronavirus and complications from coronavirus, and unfortunately our veteran population uh, are among those populations. And so I would just encourage everyone um, to be vigilant and be careful. So. Brian, um, talk yeah, to us yeah. a little bit about your what you've seen in the community. So not only, you know, more specifically than the veteran population, you know, I work specifically with uh, uh, a, a lot of the people I work with is the homeless veteran population. And as was previously said here, uh, which is should be very self-evident, is homeless people cannot self-isolate. Right. And our traditional models of group living in shelters uh, aren't set up for isolation either. So you're left in this really uh, difficult situation where, say, you have a homeless veteran and they're staying in a shelter, a group, group living situation or even a, an encampment in the woods. If they start showing symptoms of, uh, uh, you know, of the virus, well, they have to leave the shelter or leave the facility and where do they have to go? It's, it's back to the streets. Uh, and so if they hit back to the street, then you're talking about the possibility of spreading it among the rest of the homeless population. And it, it, it was really an issue. Now, fortunately for uh, our organization and the, the way that we're set up, I can promise you and myself and the other co-founders were kind of designing veterans community project and thinking about a new model and way to treat homelessness. Uh, we never said to ourselves, oh, uh, plus, if there's ever a global pandemic, our model will work better than uh, any other transitional living facility. We've been fortunate enough to have that. Each resident has their own house, so we can self-isolate. Fortunately, we have not dealt with it in our, our village of homes. However, I've been doing a lot of work with other service providers and uh, other transitional living facilities because the thing about this disease is like, I, yes, I work directly with veterans, but in order to treat veterans, uh, you have to treat the entire homeless population. You can't just you can't just pull all the veterans out and 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 keep them isolated from the situation. So I can promise that it's very real and very evident within those populations and those facilities. Yeah, well, Brian, that's great. Brian, tell us if, for folks who are, want to be involved in, in in what you're doing, how do they do that? How do they get involved? I always tell people the easiest way to get a hold of us is to go to our website, uh, veteranscommunityproject.org, because we have everything on there from volunteer opportunities. Uh, I always have to plug, uh, we are a nonprofit organization. Donations are always appreciated. Uh, but also updates on what we're doing. We have specific needs lists put out in response to COVID and where we've seen an increase in certain needs and how that can be addressed. So I think veteranscommunityproject.org is always the best place to start to learn more or get involved. Uh, except things. I mean, I know our health system was able to help secure some badly needed but very basic medical equipment, including things that can be used for telehealth visits. And that's a really important uh, adjunct. And I think there was a monitor, a webcam, a scale, cuffs, pulse ox, and some different things that, that hopefully will help out. Jill, questions from your other questions? Yeah, we do. Um, I had one person that was asking, what is the rate of COVID among the homeless and veterans, and how are you identifying it? Nicole. Wow. That's great question. question. That's a very good complex. question. I, that's a very complex question, <laughs> and I don't think I have the answer to that. So. Do, you, do you have any sense, Brian, about yeah. the rate of, of COVID within the uh, veteran community? And I'm going to, Jane and I will take that on. It, it's, a t it's a tough question yeah. because you, you can't yeah. figure out the denominator, actually. So. Yeah, I, I, I think, you know, obviously I'm. I'm in no better position than, than any of you to really address that from a numbers standpoint. And I would anticipate that we won't really fully understand the numbers, uh, you know, it, for, for quite some time right now. I know part of the problem we were running into when we were testing people is with the homeless population, uh, you have a lot of underlying health conditions in the first place. And some of those symptoms uh, are just consistently prevalent 
with a lot of the individuals that we work with. So we don't know if if they're symptomatic or running a temperature because that's really just how they are quite a bit of the time, or if this is a new development. So uh, we've been overly cautious when we identify somebody that might be showing any symptoms whatsoever. Uh, we were able to work with the city of Kansas City, Missouri, uh, secure some hotel rooms, and anybody that we saw that were symptomatic, we were able to place them into a hotel room, get them tested until we could get the results. That, that, uh, I don't know, any thoughts that you have about the answer? Because I, I think, just to say to our listening audience, you know, one of the challenges is, with the lack of testing in the United States and and the difficulty of testing because our current swab, we call it a brain biopsy, yeah. to go back so mm -hmm. far, is not easy to do. Um, and, and, and so trying to get into different populations to do testing is not something that's been a priority for the U.S. It just hasn't. Yeah. Now, our county health departments are trying to do that, but even those are often drive-by clinics. And it, it, I know Wyandotte has tried to get to some different folks who are homeless populations to get a sense of that. But it, it is a challenge to go figure out just how many, A, That's how many hard. folks are out there that are homeless, and B, how many of them have 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 SARS CoV two, so that's that's a that's a just a moving yeah, target, Dane. Absolutely. It's really hard to go get that information. Yep, absolutely. Like you said, we would like a more accurate, easier test where anybody can go to their clinic, just like getting an influenza test. But currently, mm -hmm. we don't have that. And then again, getting the outreach and getting to those populations that may not necessarily seek medical care or seek it regularly. And I think we're getting really close to being able to do saliva testing. In fact, I think that will be available mm -hmm. within a few weeks. Um, it, the, there's one. There's one reference lab here in Kansas City that's developed one, and and um, or worked with some other groups to develop one, and they're in front of the FDA yeah. now trying to get their e with their early use authorization form completed, and we're pretty convinced they've got good technology. We've examined that pretty closely, um, and I think that um, if CR, CRL can pull, pull that off, that'll be great. That's the reference lab where you're talking about. They um, and and that'll be really easy. Then you spit into a cup and on yeah. you go. Right. But the um, but the turnaround time is still a little long. So then you have to go back and find the person, a homeless person who we already gave you that, that's tough follow-up yeah, because absolutely. Th that's not a population that's great at follow-up, Nicole. Yeah, that's exactly right. So right now there's that delay between mm -hmm. testing and results, which can vary depending yeah. on uh, circumstances. Um, and so, yes, that's a population that can be very difficult to uh, determine numbers and prevalence. And remembering, as Brian has pointed out, that these people are often grouped together, and if they're asymptomatic, they're spreading mm -hmm. it before they know it. Mm -hmm. Again, because they're outside, maybe a little less, but the intensity of exposure and duration can be longer because um, they don't have places to go. And, yeah. and, and as a result, that will set folks up. Barbara's in her 60s. She has shingles. She's on Valtrex and prednisone. She asks, should any of these concern me when it comes to COVID? Oh, Dane, I think the answer to this is yes. Well, you know, I'm wondering about how much prednisone, that, that's always important as we talked about, even with treatment um, for COVID, we always talk about the dosing. So it kind of matters what, what amount of dosing. I wouldn't be too concerned about the shingles and the Valtrex. Mm -hmm. um, the Valtrex is an antiviral. Again, that will not offer any protection against COVID, though we, we should uh, state that clearly. Uh, but I think it really matters um, what amount of prednisone because that does cause some immune suppression and we have talked about people who are immunosuppressed or have those types of situations going on are probably going to be a little bit more at risk for severe disease and especially with the age as well. And wanting to know I think what underlying condition may have predisposed yep. to shingles. Mm -hmm. If you're otherwise healthy and it's stress that's one thing. Mm -hmm. um, if it's if you've got a lot of other health issues and yeah. that can be a challenge. Mm -hmm. So. Linda wants to know, what about routine annual eye exams, routine dental cleanings? And then she asks about um, cleanings for seniors. Mm -hmm. Okay, they, they, no. I think, we, I <laughs> know I was um, on a, 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 a panel last night where one of the guests was a dentist or was mm -hmm. father of the dentist and they're like, we're back open again, we yeah. can be safe, we can do it right. Yeah. And I think that's probably true as long as the office has strong PPE and infection control, which is no different, I think, than what we're doing. Yeah, guys. 100%. So, yeah. You know, I think we've certainly tried to do as much by telehealth in family, you know, I do family medicine and sports medicine. Obviously, sports medicine is a little hard to do over uh, uh, telehealth, but at least for family medicine, we've tried to do as much as possible mm -hmm. via telehealth. But there are certainly some conditions that you actually have to be seen in person for. And we have, we're fortunate here to have PPE. So 
so that we're protected. We've also taken steps to make sure that individuals who come to our clinic are not sitting out in the waiting room. We bring them back immediately. Um, we practice social distancing as much as possible. And then all of our patients are wearing a mask when they come in. And I think the dentists are the group that's really at the yeah. highest risk for transmission to yeah. it. If you look at it, if you divide this up into professional groups, from a med from a physician standpoint, dentists are or medical staff, provider standpoint, dentists are number one. I believe that ENT was number two and neurosurgeons are number three. And it's all about operating in that right. space in that where space. you can get, yeah. yeah, yeah. So Yeah, absolutely. You know, uh, that we have gone to um, extreme lengths here at KUI because we know how important it is because they are working in such close proximity with people. So they have all the proper PPE and all the proper techniques to keep each other safe and keep the patient safe. I do have a friend, a couple friends that are dentists. They have taken um, very good lengths to ensure uh, proper PPE for their staff and proper um, techniques and systems to really keep their patients safe. And I know our dental also. offices here, we have our own dentists here at KU, mm -hmm. they're open. Uh, they do take extreme measures to be safe. Yeah. I mean, it's the kind of thing, if you have a dental problem, you have a cavity that's painful, yeah. go, get your, go see your dentist. If you, yep. if you just want to go get your teeth cleaned, uh, if you want to wait a while, fine. But I think that the offices have really geared up on the PPE standpoint, so I believe that it is safe. Kathy went to the flower shop. The florist was not wearing a mask. The florist told her, you need to take your mask off. It's going to create carbon dioxide buildup, and mm. it's going to lower your immune system. Mm. Kathy's frustrated, yeah. and she wants to know, wear the mask? Or not wear the mask, well, and are those other two yeah. things true? Yeah, Kathy has a right to be frustrated. <laughs> yeah. Um, so you know, we—it's interesting. We we had Greg Noel on it on the show, the psychologist who works with us a lot here, and are in a program, and and uh, he said. You know, a few weeks ago, it was mask shaming if you didn't have a mask, and mm -hmm. now people are mask shaming because you do. I, I, that's just wrong. I, there's no two other words for it. That, what you got told in that floral shop is that's just disappointing. All I can say is, uh, if mask was danger, mask wearing was dangerous to our health, mm -hmm. all of our yeah. surgeons, would be dead. all of our anesthesiologists mm -hmm. here at the hospital would be dead. So right. this concept that uh, somehow wearing a mask. Um, increases, car I've even seen carbon monoxide. Yeah, no, that's, <laughs> see, if you have true false tests, that would be false. Yes. Carbon dioxide does not build up because you wear a mask. Just to say CO2 is one of the most movable particles or uh, gases in the world. It's going to diffuse right through the mask, as is oxygen, right into the mask. Don't be concerned about the person who told you that did not understand what they were saying and did not and know the what they were talking system. about. And Dana, the yeah, immune system, absolutely. that's also absurd. For the same reasons you very yeah. right. beautifully pointed yeah. out, yeah, yeah, all of us would be in trouble. Yes. Right, right. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. Everybody walking around the hospital would be in trouble. You know, wearing the masks in the times when you need to be wearing them, for the most part, a lot of people are not going to be needing to wear them all the time as you do in, in a hospital or a healthcare setting or something like that. Uh, but there is no uh, evidence, there's no science behind that it will reduce your immune system. Same with hand hygiene. Continue to practice good hand hygiene because washing your hands frequently or doing alcohol sanitizer is not going to reduce your immune system. Yeah, I think, unfortunately, people sometimes listen to the news. It isn't real. Mm -hmm. What we're giving you right here, folks, it's just a real story. Erica lives in a county where they have seen a sharp spike. It went from one to 90 cases in a four-day span. She has pulmonary hypertension. She said she's been incredibly vigilant, but the people around her are not. How does she educate them? Um, ask them to listen to Dana right. Hawkinson and, and Dr. Linsky <laughs> and everybody in the program, <laughs> and that's what we're doing every day. Um, you know, there are a lot of counties that are having spikes in Kansas and Missouri. They, those cases were probably out there. Part of it can always be testing, just testing better. But part of it is there's just more spread. There can be a single super spreader event or an outbreak related to some sort of a thing like a meatpacking plant or a prison or a jail, mm -hmm. which are the two in nursing homes. Those are the three major areas right now mm -hmm. that have sprung a lot of outbreaks throughout the United States. If you look at the biggest clusters, there was a, a list yeah, uh, two days ago, I think, that they listed the biggest clusters. I think it was in the New York Times. And, and, and they listed the biggest clusters. I think it's also on the John Hopkins website. Um, and those were the major things. It's all about uh, people where they're incarcerated, being in a meatpacking plant. Uh, churches are in that list and others because those are the play things where people are together for a long period of time. So I, I'm not surprised. As far as what you can do, wow, your bubble is really important. We've talked about your bubble goes with you everywhere, right? So the people you're around and you travel, you take that bubble with you because whatever diseases they have, you're likely to have and you may give them to someone else. 
and when those bubbles intersect, that's when you get in. That's where you can. can that's where uh, diseases can spread. So I, I think the pillars of infection control are all still the correct ones, if possible. Wear a mask during the day. It's not going to build up your carbon dioxide. It's also not going to raise your pulmonary artery pressure. I actually started a pulmonary program, hypertension program here years ago, and mm -hmm. that's a tough disease. But <clears throat> it's managed now much better than it used to be with therapy. But you really have to still follow those pillars, and you're going to have to wear a mask when you can. But most importantly, isolate, use social distancing of at least six mm -hmm. feet, wash your hands, don't touch your face, ask everybody around you to cough into your elbow. Yeah, Talk absolutely. Hot. Continue to do those things. <clears throat> you can... Um, be individually responsible and do all of those things and reduce your risk as much as you can by doing those simple things. Pam was around a family member 10 days ago. They just tested positive. She wants to know, should she get a test? Hawk? Um, let's see, she was around people 10 days ago. I think you would just continue to isolate right now, self-quarantine until that 14 days from your last exposure. If you start to develop symptoms or something odd, again, because we know that they, you can have atypical symptoms, um, then certainly I would call your, your health care provider and then maybe try to get a test at that point. But you are almost at the 14-day quarantine anyway. Yeah, it should be pretty safe, I think. Yeah. Yeah, I think, you know, certainly there's a level of, of caution. Um, so uh, I think that the 14 day quarantine is perfectly yeah. appropriate. So, Brian, I am just intrigued about your tiny houses at 89th and Troost. I'm going to go drive by that this weekend. Yeah. I, I know I've seen some articles, and the Star has covered that, if I remember. Um, but I haven't been by. I'm going to go by and take a look. Over what period of time have you all been able to build those houses? Uh, so the first, so the organization was started in really myself, the other co-founders left our full-time jobs in the summer of 2016. Uh, the first 13 houses went up in January of 2018. Uh, it, it, it took a while there because when we left our jobs, we didn't have anything at that point. We were just kind of, you know, uh, running up, running up debt on our own credit cards and trying to build capacity and get people on board for this big idea. Uh, so the first 13 went up in January, 2018. We added another 13 in November, 2018. And then this past, uh, this then basically one year later, we added 23 more houses in a 5,000 square foot community center. Uh, that community center is really at the heart of what we do down there because that's where our case manager offices are. That's where our dental exam room, the medical exam room that you had pointed out earlier that uh, you, your organization has is, is helped us outfit in order to you know provide on-site services, which is so important. Uh, because, uh, as the doctor was saying earlier about being in the military, one of the great things about it is uh, lots of times you're on a base and there's, you know, one building you go to for everything. Uh, so we're trying to recreate a little bit of that in our community center and bring care to the residents of the village. That's brilliant. Good. Well done. Just keep yes. everybody there uh, in face masks and with hand sanitizer. We, <laughs> yeah. got, we got to keep them healthy, you yeah, know, that's sure. keep right. it running for sure. And keep your team healthy. Yeah. That's what I'm... Craig writes, SARS is a cousin to SARS-CoV-2, and SARS just disappeared. Could SARS-CoV-2 also disappear? And where did SARS go? Mm -hmm. Yeah, SARS-CoV-1 and SARS-CoV-2. You know, yeah. the good thing about naming these viruses is we can make it as confusing as possible. <laughs> yes. um, and, and, and that helps enlighten the, the, the public and, 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 and make you think harder about it. But, Dana, SARS-CoV-1 was interesting, not as transmissible as SARS-CoV-2. And that has a big, that's a big reason. It kind of disappeared. Yeah, so another way to make it so uh, complicated we could talk about homology and how alike they are they seem to be about 80 percent alike if you look at their genome but absolutely to your point um, unfortunately with SARS-CoV-2 we found that you are probably quite infectious one to two days prior to any symptoms to one to two days after and then it drops off from there um, luckily with SARS they were able to isolate people and contact trace because it doesn't seem like you were as infectious until several days after symptoms began so that is one of the main reasons and even when you were infectious it wasn't like, it wasn't as readily transmissible right. as SARS-CoV-2 yeah. yeah. is and, and that has a lot to do with just how the virus and that, that's true about any virus sometimes yeah. they're very transmissible and sometimes they're not so transmissible and and if you remember what uh, Fauci had always said, the head of uh, the infectious disease mm -hmm. portion of, the, of uh, NIH, other, uh, and, and, he, and he commented uh, that his biggest nightmare was a highly transmissible yeah. respirable, respirable 
and um, very fatal virus, which is kind of what SARS-CoV-2 <laughs> yeah. became. Absolutely. And so because of those things that we've talked about, um, we would love if it just went away. But obviously now, how many months into this from when it was first identified, um, it has not gone away. And all it currently is doing is continuing to spread among vulnerable populations. So the likelihood it's going to go is low because it's got a big reservoir of people that it can travel between. And, and, it, and we want to believe that weather will change it. Mm -hmm. But the world teaches us that weather isn't changing it because SARS-CoV-2 is very prevalent right now in South America where it's winter. It's very prevalent in Latin America or Arizona where it's really hot. And it's very prevalent, of course, really hot in Kansas City here now. Mm -hmm. And it's very prevalent throughout the Northern Hemisphere. So weather doesn't, it's not going to do this because it's spread into too many people. And even if weather changed it a little bit, yeah. it's not going to make it go away because it's so respirable. When we say it's so respirable, what that means is that when we breathe, it's easy to transmit the virus. That wasn't as true about SARS-CoV-1. Right. It's much more true about SARS-CoV-2. The other coronaviruses out there, which called caused Middle Eastern Respiratory Syndrome, or MERS, mm -hmm. is still out there. Mm -hmm. uh, the good news is it there's is. actually vaccination therapy yeah. for MERS. There's things we can do about that. Um, I think there. Will, I think we're going to get there on, on SARS-CoV-2. I'm, I'm an eternal optimist, and I believe yeah. we're going to have vaccination by uh, early 2021. We're, we're continuing to work. I know some of that work um, is being piggybacked that was being evaluated for the vaccines for MERS. So um, I think that has helped al going along with the vaccine. It's helped a lot. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. But unfortunately, SARS-CoV-2 has some pretty good targets on it that are, if those targets were to disappear from the virus, it wouldn't be so fatal then. Okay. Yeah. Who cares? Right. Then it's just a regular coronavirus. It's those targets that, that folks are after. Jessica is asking for tips for restaurant workers. Mm, I, I'm okay. sure that they're wow. fearful. They probably are. Yeah. If I was a restaurant worker, yeah. I would be a little yeah. fearful because you're coming in contact with a lot of people. Lot of people. Uh, and, and I think that, but you know, it's the same pillars of infection control. And it's the things that, Dana, Dana you've worked with some of our local businesses mm -hmm. about and trying to recommend what they yeah. can do to keep their employees and their customers safe. And remember, that's a moral responsibility yeah. for all of us. We've got to keep each other safe. Yeah, I think the main things to, to be concerned about are the same thing that, that we've talked about. You know, if you do have interactions with customers, it's probably not going to be for that long at a time, taking an order, um, or if you're serving, serving or hostessing, setting people down. But there are things you can do. I think the mask is vitally important because you are going to be in fairly close proximity with people, even though it's probably not going to be for a long time. Continue to adequate hand hygiene and doing it frequently. For the, for the cases of just the virus itself and the infection, I've really never been a proponent of gloves because I think they just offer a false sense of security and then you start touching more things because you have gloves on. But things understand that things can just get caked down the gloves as well. So if you're practicing hand hygiene, specifically, specifically for the topic of the virus and the infection, I don't think you need gloves. If there are other reasons you need to be doing in the restaurant, certainly be doing that. Uh, but again, continue the hand hygiene, continue the mask, um, continue to be as separated from people for as long as you can, uh, you know, unless you have to do your job. Um, and if you continue to do those things, I think you'll be able to keep yourself safe quite I a mean, bit. I mean, what you'd prefer is a waiter or waitress that um, you're six feet away from the, the customer as much as possible. Mm -hmm. What we know is that brief contact, like I'm, I'm putting food in front of you, and I'm putting food in front of you, right. that's a brief contact. That's probably not going to do it. Mm -hmm. It's a more prolonged contact. Yeah, for a long do period it. of time, yeah, yeah. especially have, without wearing a mask. Right. Now, have you had patients who have come to you and said, hey, my job is asking me to come back. I don't feel safe? They have. Um, and certainly individuals who are at higher risk for complications from coronavirus. And it's as simple for me as, as asking their employers to try and make accommodations to allow for uh, teleworking if possible or asking that their employer a mandate for mask wearing or things like that so that they can uh, reduce that risk of transmission or you know at the end of the day if the if the employee does have time to that they can take off of work or perhaps even other other avenues that they can pursue they yeah well, I realize now it's about 8.45, so our time has kind of escaped us. I didn't do a very good job of watching that. <laughs> Brian, final thoughts today. And, and uh, again, hats off to you and the, and the great work you've done. i got a story I want to tell, but let's start with, with, uh, <laughs> let's start with you. No, I would just like to kind of wrap up by 
you know, thanking you for having me on and uh, allowing me this platform to kind of uh, spread uh, information about what we're doing down here. And uh, I would encourage anybody, you mentioned that you wanted to come out and uh, I'll, I'll tell you, you should just get a hold of me and I'll take and show you around the village a little bit. But again, if you want to learn more about us or keep updated on how this pandemic is affecting us or anything like that, please visit our website, veteranscommunityproject.org. And one last thank you for having me. Thank you for your service and yeah. thanks for what you're doing. What great work. Yeah. Dr. Yablinski, thank you for your service. Thank you very much. Anything else you want? I thought you want to leave us with today? No, I mean, I, I thank you for having me. It's been a great privilege to talk about how this virus in particular is affecting our, our veteran and military service member communities. Yeah, well, thank you guys both. Dr. Hawk, anything else today? Yeah, I just appreciate both of these great service members for doing that, um, doing what they're doing, continuing to do it. We understand that, um, you know, our, our volunteers for our military really give the greatest sacrifice. And so we understand that going into those theaters of war, um, some of these things can be hard to process. Everything can be hard to process when, when you do that. And, and coming back and now dealing with the pandemic can even exaggerate them even more. So just very thankful and appreciative of everything you guys have done. Yeah, and I just I, I want to say thank you. I did not have the, the privilege of serving in the military. Um, those are some of those things where you said, if, what would I have done if I lived my life over? I should have done that. I, I should have played high school football. And <laughs> there's some things I, I needed to have done. My brother did. Um, he served in Vietnam, uh, 101st Airborne, was exposed to Agent Orange, ended up with yeah. prostate cancer, heart disease, and, and uh, a lot of lifelong struggles from the chronic stress of that. Was a lawyer. And uh, ended up um, uh, defending a lot of people who couldn't afford uh, lawyers and, um, and, and trying to uh, help them uh, achieve civil uh, and, and, and justice. And I think that what, um, what, what we all learn is that chronic stress and I think uh, major psychological trauma affects us forever. Mm -hmm. And the work that you all are doing is to be commended for trying to address some of that. Things we need to probably talk more about on this program, whether it's what we're seeing in the streets around racial stress or veterans or other groups, uh, these are things we should have honest conversations about. And we hope that folks view this as a safe place where they can do that. We'll be back here tomorrow. Uh, it is a safe place and we're gonna try and keep you safe. Mm -hmm. And we're gonna ask you to remember one thing. There's still no place like home. And wherever you go, those pillars of infection control are not a hoax. It's very true. And the more you realize that, the more you do to stay safe, the more safe you're going to be. We'll see you tomorrow.